So I'm here to talk about uh, serverless on Kubernetes, what we learned from customers. In this case, we, it's Microsoft, Microsoft Azure. That's where we work. Um, I was actually in Barcelona at the first edition of this event. And I thought it was great to see all the technologies, the community contributing to the Kubernetes um, system. But I felt like us, we've, we've been in this space for a while now, and we didn't have a chance to kind of contribute, to really say what are we building, what we're doing, and what we learn. So that's why I'm here to talk about this. How many of you were at KubeCon and attended serverless prediction or day? Let's see. It was about less than half year. But it's a um, great event. And even today, you've seen some of the technology. Some of the questions are really interesting. And I hope to actually tackle some of them here. Um, before I go too far, so um, I lead some of the Microsoft serverless initiatives. In particular, I lead the product team for Azure Functions. Because you're not familiar with it, I got a shirt with the logo, so now you know what it is, for those of you who've never seen it. Um, and for the next 30 minutes, what I would like to do is tell what we learned from customers, but go a little, back, a little further back. Um, our journey, where we are in the organization, we saw the application paradigms evolving over time and customers enabling more and more scenarios. So covering each paradigm, what customers liked, what they didn't like, what the gaps were. And then I'll move, uh, hang with me, I'll take you guys on the journey and I'll get to Kubernetes towards the middle of the presentation. What are we doing in Kubernetes and what we think we can even do further and how we can all collaborate. We're here to chat and to learn as well, but, but there's some stuff that we bring to the table as Microsoft that I think is really interesting. So we started, um, and I use the term serviceful, we started on this journey of providing application developers the platform that had to worry the least about infrastructure, the least about what's under the covers, only worry about their code and nothing else as much as possible. That was about 2012. We launched a product called Azure Websites, uh, later become Azure Web Space Sites, later become Azure App Service. I'm not gonna talk about our branding department, but still it is there today, very popular. But because we're talking serverless, I wanna talk about how we delivered, how we activated applications. The first thing in that serviceful journey we did was HTTP serving. Essentially, you could bring your applications to, essentially to our, our cloud web servers and we'll do the load balancing for you. And I'll explain how we work in the cloud in a very high level diagram of the architecture. We have on the blue box, we have um, our infrastructure has front ends. And then green are workers where we run your code. We run the customer's code, their applications. All of those are, and typically, I didn't make it to scale, but there are thousands of, of machines, uh, literally in over 50 data centers around the world and they're in scale units. So it allows for us to give sort of that infinite elastic scale. Back then, uh, when serviceful, you could say, hey, I, I wanna have a plan, I wanna put my application in, let's say, one, two, 10, 20 nodes. You would tell us where you, how many nodes you want the application to run. What we took care for you was how to sort of route those HTTP requests to your application, we'll take care of sort of a little bit of the firewall, so um, denial of service attacks will take care of that firewall. We'll make sure their application is ready to receive, not overload one machine, make sure we use all of them um, to, the best, to the best we could. So that's how, that's how we started, but we also built a bunch of shared services. And then we could provide additional functionality like make authentication much easier, talking to other services without having to learn tons of APIs provide security, ability of adding certificates, and so on and so forth. Because our mission was abstract you from things that you shouldn't need to worry about. With that, and I, I'll sprinkle some of what the customers did at each stage that we developed those products. One that I want to talk about is um, one of the largest TV networks in Canada, they're running the elections, and as the candidates were talking on the screen, they want to feel a sentiment whether the population watching were favorable or not favorable to some of those. So they would put a, a link, a short link there, right there, as the broadcast was going on, that you could click and you could, you could answer a poll. Um, I don't know a whole lot about Canadian elections, so I'll spare you of those details, but I know the technical part. 
which is um, they were able, and might be a little small, but they were able to get, even back then, close to one million requests per second on that type of architecture, which is all that the company had to do was deploy their code, all the scaling, all the nice functionality certificates and all that was all taken care of for them. So we kept going on serviceful, and we did, we did a lot more. We did out of scale, and looking back, that was amazing that we could detect when your CPU was at 80% and add another machine, uh, or scale based on memory, or HTTP queue length. We started multi-language from the get-go. Back then, there were tons of PHP developers. I hope not as many today, but um, joking aside, we started, we had Java, we had uh, Python, et cetera. CI, CD before DevOps was such, as, as big of a thing as it is now, zero downtime deployments, and so on and so forth. So serviceful, super popular. To this day, Azure App Service, the third most popular service in Azure. Um, that's how most of the people build uh, sort of uh, applications in Azure. Then um, in 2014, we started on the event-driven journey, is when we noticed not everything's HTTP, and HTTP in, is not the best protocol for you to implement all applications out there. There are applications that you need different types of eventing. You want, you want, you want the predictability of being able to look of how many items are in a queue to see how much you need to provision to serve that queue. You need the guaranteed delivery. You need the order processing and all that. So once we start providing event-driven applications, when we saw a rise in applications doing batch processing or async workloads, and um, at first, as that example I showed was completely synchronous, but we saw more and more async. Um, we saw a lot of folks that started with an application, and in order to connect to another application, they would use a queue in the middle, so two applications could talk to each other, or service bus in the case of Azure. And then we saw a lot of, um, extensibility endpoints being created by enabling event-driven applications. The technology that we enabled is the one that first showed was Azure website, where customers were allocating machines, but those machines were not running hot all the time. So our customers said, hey, can I drop my own executable to run on those machines as well? And it runs, let's say, once a day or every hour or something, but it's not even serving any web traffic. And we're like, sure, use this functionality called web jobs. And you could drop whatever you want to run there, as long as obeys the laws of PaaS, which means you cannot access the OS, you cannot change the online OS, you cannot access the registry, you'd stay at that high level abstraction. But given that, you could have this concept of web jobs and would be integrated with your source, uh, you could do your CI CD just like you normally would. You get all the other serviceful properties of it. And then the pattern that we saw emerging was a lot of these websites now they will try to respond as quickly as possible to their customers. So what they would do is they would do the synchronous workload, would, the website would respond, anything could be done later, would be entered in a queue to be later processed. That queue, the web jobs would pick up uh, an item from that queue and process it asynchronously, and then do, let's say, AI is a very common example. Um, the website would log data, a web job would pick some say, hey, there's a new entry in the log, we we'll pick that log for processing, structure that data, process some AI, now you have some intelligence that you didn't have before. Um, for that to happen, for us to be able to read from the queue, we implemented also, we released also the Web Jobs SDK. Essentially something that can, knows how to talk to all these different event source types um, and know how to activate your, your workload. So that's when we started on this event-driven um, journey. And that was almost all the elements we needed to have a full, something we could call a function as a service offering as well, and serverless. And that's when we released um, Azure Functions um, came around. Um, we increased the amount of triggers that we, that we had on the platform. I'll show some of them later. This was a, that's a massive difference is the event-driven scale. So instead of scaling now because your machine is constrained on CPU, we would look at those events, predict what you need as a workload, and then allocate your code in as many machines as you need it. Once you don't need them anymore, scale them back down to zero. Again, folks who are using to still glue applications together, that's probably still to this day the main use of serverless that I see, um, and extend your applications. A lot of customers already have either their monolith or something already deployed. 
When they ask us how they get started with service, we tell them extend your app. We don't typically go tell them go rewrite everything that you already have deployed. I think the best entry into serverless is find something that's event-based, add your code there, and extend that way. Um, and before I talk about functions, how many of you tried functions or played with functions before? The entire room raised their hand. No, I'm kidding. Just uh, was was about half actually. So. So I'll show real quick, um, for those of you who've never seen Azure Functions, so because our journey was always developer productivity, we have a whole experience on Visual Studio, but some folks don't even have Visual Studio Code installed maybe, so Visual Studio Code is even better now. You have a, a full version that's online. It's the same idea but runs in the browser. So I'm gonna just create a simple function that reads from a queue, kind of like the example of showing it to web jobs, but now in a function. So once you are in Visual Studio and you have um, functions, you get all these nice commands where you can start a, a project. Um, and then you can pick one of the languages. Those are the languages supported in Azure Functions. I'm gonna pick JavaScript. Um, and you can pick any of those trigger types here. So I mentioned we support um, a large amount of triggers, so you can see that list there. Um, and I'll pick you. First to see, this is the name of the function, just my, for my own code. This is the variable or, or the setting that I'll know how to talk to my queue, the name of my queue, and that's it. That will provision everything you need and will even stub out your, the code for you. And that's all that a, uh, a function look, looks like. It's a single line of code and that's your function. And that function is know how to read from a queue. So if I go look at the files here, there's one setting that I have to set here, which is this one needs to talk to an actual queue for the demo to work. I'm gonna use the best clipboard in the world, which is Notepad. Uh, it's also Microsoft product, okay. Um, that's, it is Microsoft product, but anyways. So I configured, I configured this to talk to actual, the storage account that I have. The only other thing to, to call out your attention is a function is also configuration. So that queue that we're gonna talk to is in this JSON file here. It says the queue name, that variable that I'm gonna read from to know where to connect. So once I do that, you could debug um, this function. So if I click debug here, um, and I'm gonna, um, once you saw, it was really quick, but once you saw the ASCII art, just like my shirt, the function's logo means that the runtime is running. That, run, that version of runtime that runs on Visual Studio Code Online or Visual Studio Code installed on a machine or Visual Studio or the cloud is the exact same version. is .NET Core, so it behaves the exact same way wherever you go. So I'm gonna set the breakpoint here so we can debug this function. I have on my Edge browser, um, I have my queue that I wanna write to. So once there is a message on that queue, uh, and I'm, it doesn't matter what I write here, but I'm just so you know it's I'm demoing it live. Once I add an item to the queue, because that function, that function is monitoring that queue, it will debug and, and just stop the debugger right on that line. So you can see that exactly what I typed is on, on that variable. So I could debug, see if something is wrong, continue my development here, um, and I'll let this function run. So once it's run, if I go back to the queue, that item got processed and the function is done. Once I'm ready, with this code, after I'm done developing, I can go to the Azure extension and deploy this to the cloud. And again, you can, and I'll get to that later, you can deploy this to, in several ways, several targets, but it's as simple as that to use Azure Functions, very few lines of code, but some of you haven't seen it, now, now you know, you can, and you can try. Um, But how does scaling work? I showed um, a single function that, that works out of a queue. Um, and the function has the JavaScript, the JSON file. But the function typically, and you see the function cycle a little blurry, it's not really running until events start happening. So in that part of the first architecture I showed that you have the shared services on Azure, you have one component called the scale controller. That component is the one that knows when to wake up your function, when to go from zero to one. The scale controller, as soon as you deploy a function, is gonna start looking to the event source. And once it notices there are items to be processed, in this case in the queue, it will say, okay, I need to add my function and instantiate that in an actual machine. The function itself will know how to pull those events to the queue and start processing them. 
So the, the scale controller is really the brain of the serverless scaling that we have in, in our cloud infrastructure. Once the event, uh, the scale controller sees that tons of events are happening, it's, it scales out and puts a lot more functions to run all in parallel. And we'll scale back in. I probably don't have the animation to scale back in once events are, are not happening anymore. So that's what we built, the event-driven scale. And then I want to show again what customers start doing with that. So probably all of you know Fujifilm as a brand. Um, what I didn't know when I came, came to talk to them is they developed this product called ImageWorks that they sell to corporations that want to manage all their digital photography assets. And they provide functionality such as browse and search and post, post, to, post to online channels as well. So they sold that to the Japanese baseball league. Uh, uh, baseball is huge in Japan. And what they want to do is as soon as pictures are being taken by multiple photographers doing a baseball game, they will be made as quickly as possible available to be tagged and posted to social media. The process initially was literally the photographers have their Nikon cameras with an SD card. They will go to a machine, a computer, put their SD card, picture by picture, add the metadata. Player name, jersey, position that they played, which inning of the game that was happening. This will take hours for the picture to be available for social media tagging. And in this day and age, that's not acceptable. You want to do your tweet right away, right? Um, so they wrote the architecture and they wrote straight into serverless. They, they get the, the pictures get imported into a system. As soon as the pictures get added, a batch of pictures from a photographer gets added, they start the serverless workload. In functions, we have this concept called durable functions that allow you to orchestrate a set of functions, independent functions. It will keep state so it knows where the executions are and knows when to wake up to continue executing or when to resume some execution. Within that durable function, the first thing it does is pre-process the image, so rotate the image, resize, make sure it's ready to be processed the model. And in parallel, it runs a facial recognition model to know which player that picture uh, was from and uh, wh who's the player in the picture. And then all the other properties in custom mo uh, machine learning models to know jersey number, position that they play, any, et cetera. They would use as input at the very bottom some um, data that's uh, available to everyone about the professional baseball records. And Durable Function has this great concept that knows you can literally add to your code a clause that says when all, which means when all these functions are done, because if you've done map reduce, the map part of map reduce is easy. The reduce part's much harder. But you can do when all, and the durable function know that all of them are done. It will put all these results could together, extrapolate, add to an index database, so these pictures could be searched and be available for, for um, any of the Japanese baseball league customers to tag and post online. So they did this, and they reduced the time. In less than two minutes, they had pictures from the point that it was taken to be available which was taking hours before. But what Fujifilm really liked was the developer productivity. They built this whole solution in months instead of having to provision infrastructure and take much longer for them to do it. Actually, less than two months uh, is what they took. There's a whole case study on it online. So that's what customers did then, but we kept evolving as a platform. Um, and I attend a lot of, uh, it's only my second KubeCon, I attend a lot of serverless conferences, and in the past, Containers and Kubernetes were the, the art nemesis of, of serverless. Like, they didn't talk containers at all in those conferences. But hey, we, became, we started becoming best friends over time. Um, a lot of it was this ability of you taking the same container and be able to deploy anywhere. The amount of targets you can put now your functions was, was much higher. You could also um, bring your own dependencies. We see a lot of, especially once we release Python functions, a lot of machine learning dependencies that are pretty unique, and you want to package that with your application. So, so we saw tons of use of containers. Obviously, Kubernetes is going to be a big use of it. Um, and all we did that was a little different was we didn't want, although people wanted containers, a lot of developers never edited a Docker file in their lives. So. So we, in our tooling, which is this func command that we see, it's part of our command line tooling, we did a command that func init docker only, it provisioned the docker file for you, that has the base image that contains the function runtime, the one that's portable, the one that I demoed to you here, and then you can add your additional dependencies there. 
But even if you don't even understand what this is, this would just work for you to deploy to a container. All the rest would work the same as you, as you would expect. So that's our journey in container. One, what enabled us, I should say, what enabled us to do this, we also changed our runtime from being .NET Framework to .NET Core and .NET Core's cross-platform. So you could deploy to any target, Windows or Linux, and you can develop on a Mac, on a Windows or Linux as well. Now, getting to Kubernetes, because that's a Kubernetes conference, and, um, and, and what was starting to happen for us is we would go in all these large customer calls ready to present serverless and the benefits in productivity and, and cost efficiencies of serverless, and then the customer themselves would tell us, look, this doesn't work for me. I need my code to run right next to my data. My data is on-prem. I can't just move that data to the cloud. No way. Compute needs to be close to it. I have really low latency. Or I want to audit every step of the way. Or I want custom OS modules. I don't want your version of a Windows Server. I want the version of the server that I have that has my modules. Um, Multi-cloud became much more, instead of buzzword, much more of a thing. One customer that I don't have an example here talk about Smursk, the shipping container company. Um, they do deploy to both Azure and, uh, and Google at the same time. So, so this is a real need from real enterprise customer. And then hardware options also. Like some customers wanted to run all of that in FPGA hardware or GPU. And it takes a little, it takes some time for those options to be available in our service. But you could deploy those on-prem. So there was a huge need for Kubernetes. So that was the good news. Yeah, Kubernetes, community, excited. But then we started interviewing application developers. And they started saying, this is, this is way too complicated for us. We don't want to learn all these new concepts to deploy my piece of Python or JavaScript code or Java code. I want just the productivity gains that you showed me before, but on the Kubernetes infrastructure. And these are actual quotes for some of the, some of the folks we talked to um, and the, the issues that they had with Kubernetes. So we went into this journey of let's bring some of what we learned through all these years to the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. So, so now this is the same slide. This is functions running in a container, but imagine that now you have your Kubernetes cluster. You have... Um, Tons of machines in there. They're all obviously Docker compatible. And all the developer wants to do is to write that really simple JavaScript function that reads from a queue. So, so you still, what you would you do is you do the funk init Docker only that you create your Docker file. And here's the sort of the magical element here is you do funk Kubernetes install CADA. And CADA replaced the scale controller. That component that I showed before we had in our proprietary infrastructure in Azure, we developed it open source in partnership with Red Hat and others to provide that same benefit in Kubernetes uh, ecosystem, actually native to the concepts that are there. So install the CRDs, it communicates with the HPA and all that. And actually this component is much simpler than the one that we have in the cloud. Um, the, the types of event sources also that we got much richer because it whatever the folks using Kubernetes wanted to have. I know the font's pretty small, but you can see there's uh, 12 or 13 of them, and those scalars keep getting added. Once you do that, you can run another command that will take that function and deploy that to Kubernetes. Again, application developer might not even understand Kubernetes, know the difference between a pod or a container. It doesn't matter. This will deploy it for them. Now, when events happen, Kada notices it, then no instances are running of your code. Only when an event happens, you create one instance to run it. And we'll scale from zero to one, then one to n, and then back n as well once events start happening. Um, there's a lot more details on Kada. Actually, Jeff Wizier has a session later in the week on Thursday to talk more about it. But that allowed us for us to start going on the Kubernetes um, journey and allow application developers to take the most, uh, make the most out of the platform. And just to show how, how real this is, this was presented, that's why it's blurry because I literally took a screenshot, but it was presented Spring 1 by Best Buy, um, the architecture that they have. And the way Best Buy does things is um, they receive the products and they ingest those products in the data centers that they have um, around the United States. In there, they have their own data centers, they install Kubernetes there. 
but all their developers want to do is to use Spring Cloud functions. No matter if it's on-prem, no matter if it's in the cloud, they want to write code the way they, they always written. So they love this model of having Azure functions that they can put in the cloud. Some of the workload gets processed on-prem, sends the event to the cloud for additional processing, but for the developers, it's just a Spring Cloud function, and it's event-based architecture. But this is a real like um, um, on-prem and cloud uh, application. Now, here's where, um, where I think we, we should go next. I talked a lot about the technologies that are already in place. I think once we combine all these things, I think I showed a lot of serviceable bullets and I didn't even show them all. If we bring some more of that functionality to Kubernetes, it's a win for everyone. When I walk on the, here in KubeCon, you see that there are vendors doing one thing or the other. They're doing security. They're doing like uh, so many networking vendors and all that, but providing that in a way that de developers can easily consume, I don't feel like it's quite there yet. Um, Providing real fast on top of Kubernetes is another big need. So we can bring that all together and really bring the power of all of those things. Um, once we do do that as a community, and again, it's not Microsoft alone, it's really all, all of us contributing, that's when um, you're gonna have that magical thing between control productivity sweet spot. Today's one versus the other, and then you can bring them all together. Now, in Again, my, my job is talking to customers most of the time, and what we see is serverless is still not being used in highly regulated industries. You go to financial industries, you go to healthcare, they don't use it because they don't have all the controls that they need. So doing the first two bullets there, I think is when serverless can be more mainstream instead of being just glue or extensibility. So it's a huge opportunity for all of us that work in the serverless space. Um, and and as we learn, and Kata was huge for us in terms of learning and, and the success we, we achieved there, that we can only get that through open source to partner with folks that have been in that space longer than even we have. Um, here's where we are. Some of the projects that my team has been involved directly are there. They're open source. There are some companies contributing with us, and we want to do much more. So this slide's essentially a call for contribution. We have you know, over 100 contributors, uh, but I think we welcome many, many more contributors in there. Um, we'll be here throughout the week. I put some links there if you want to learn more about the technology. Um, there's a micro, Microsoft booth where, where the team's going to be hanging out. Um, Jeff's session to go more into CADA and learn more about that and some announcements that he's going to make. And, and I'm available for questions on social media or any other way. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we think we have three minutes. Time for some questions. None? No, there we go. Okay. So it's a, it's a very good overview of everything that, that Microsoft does in the, in the space. How does Dapper fit into that picture? How does what? Dapper fits into that picture. Dapper. So, um, so Dapper, and I, I was considering adding it, but because it was new, I was like, I need to get my ducks in order, but Dapper extends the programming model. So in functions, you can do a bunch of things with the programming model functions. Some of it I showed here. But there are some things that once you plug in Dapper, you can do more, like PubSub being a great example of things that you can do with just functions natively. So when you think of, not the service, but the programming model itself, the real programming, if you wanna extend your application to do more, that's when combining Dapper within applications, not just functions. ESP.NET, I think, is a very powerful concept. So that's somewhere in between a, a pure function and a Azure Container instance, you would say? Uh, I see more an extension of the code in the application that you're running, not on the service part. So you can get an application that you have by implementing a simple protocol and running that in a sidecar container next to you. Now your application is much more powerful without you having to change your code much just by implementing that protocol. Thanks. Um, Any more? All right, cool. Thank you, Eduardo. All right, thank you. Eduardo, thank you.